Welcome to our panel discussion, uh, which has been entertainingly titled, The President's Super Regulators, What's Next for OIRA? Today's conversation is about a little known but very important unit of the federal government. I say little known, but of course that's the people outside the Beltway, inside the Beltway, uh, I think folks hear quite often from OIRA. Uh, OIRA, of course, is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It is one of the components of government that I have the most difficulty pronouncing. Uh, so I, I hope that you'll bear with me as I slur through both that and federal regulations, which I also can't say. Um, basically, OIRA uh, serves many roles. Uh, one of them, of course, is the review of federal reg regulations. See, there you go. And it pays particularly close attention to agency proposed rules that impose more than $100 million in annual costs on affected industries. Of course, it has a broader effect than that as well. Over the years, there's been great debate over the role of OIRA. Uh, at its uh, instantiation, there was significant debate over whether it should exist. Uh, that debate has moved to some extent to focus on whether Congress should be engaged more actively with the regulatory process or whether uh, OIRA's role and scope should be increased as well. Uh, with the departure of the current administrator of OIRA, Cass Sunstein, uh, we have a particularly uh, sort of good time to talk about uh, the questions about the future of OIRA and what has happened over the last four years. So just a little bit about today's event. Uh, it's hosted by the Advisory Committee on Transparency, and you can tell because I've got the sign behind me saying so. Uh, the Advisory Committee is a project of the Sunlight Foundation. You can learn more about it at transparencycaucus.org. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, uh, Representatives Daryl Issa and Mike Quigley, for uh, helping to host the event. And I'd like to start by introducing our panel of experts. Uh, so in uh, starting all the way to my right, we have Curtis Copeland. He's a consultant for the Administrative Conference of the United States. And for many years, he worked for the Congressional Research Service as a specialist in American uh, national government. Did I get the title right? Yep. Yeah, OK. Uh, between the two of us is Susan Dudley. She is currently the director of the Regulatory Studies Center at George Washington University, and she served as an administrator of OIRA under George W. Bush. To my immediate left is Michael Fitzpatrick. Boy, today is not a good day for me. He is the senior manager and senior counsel of government and regulatory affairs for General Electric, and he served as the number two, the associate administrator for OIRA under President Obama. And uh, at the end of the table is Rob Weissman, who has many great accomplishments, but the most relevant one for today is that he is the president of Public Citizen. And of course, I'm Daniel Schumann, Policy Counsel with the Sunlight Foundation and also director of the Advisory Committee on Transparency. Uh, so the way today's conversation is, is going to go is pretty simple. Uh, we're going to have uh, opening statements from each of the panelists for a couple of minutes. We'll then have a conversation amongst ourselves, and if everybody in the room is still awake, we will encourage conversation and questions from the audience as well. So we're going to start with Curtis, please. Sure, thank you. Um, Daniel asked me to sort of be the scene setter to sort of lay out uh, the history of OIRA. Is this on? There, now it is on. Okay, so to, to lay out the history of OIRA and how it's changed over time. So I'm going to collapse 30 years of OIRA history into seven minutes, uh, which is no small thing. Um, I would point out for any of you that are congressional staff that, uh, that you can get a more detailed summary in our CRS report, that's, and the number is, get your pens ready, RL32397, RL32397, and those of you that aren't CR, uh, congressional staff can probably Google it and get copies <laughs> of it that way too. Uh, but anyway, um, I, as, as um, Daniel mentioned, uh, OIRA is often referred to as, uh, as Business Week did in 2009, the most powerful agency most people outside the Beltway have never heard of. Um, and although presidents uh, from Johnson to Carter have had some type of presidential review process, as, as uh, Jim Tozy over in the corner will, will tell you, um, OIRA was sort of the first institutionalization of that. Uh, it was created by the Paperwork Reduction Act of 1980 and was originally focused solely on paperwork issues, information collection issues, reviewing and improving agencies' information collection requests. It covered virtually every agency in the federal government, uh, and OIRA reviewed and still does review about four to 6,000 information collection requests a year. So all these paperwork requests that come from the agencies to collect information from the public, they have to go through OMB. 
Um, in February 1981, though, shortly after the PRA was enacted, um, President Reagan uh, issued Executive Order 12291, which really changed the nature of OIRA. It moved them from reviewing the paperwork request to the substance of agencies' rules. The executive order covered cabinet departments and independent agencies like EPA, but not, did not include independent regulatory agencies like the FCC, SEC, and so forth. Um, under that executive order, agencies had to send their draft proposed and final rules to OMB for review, and, exec and the executive order told the agencies to quote unquote, refrain from publishing those rules until after responding to OMB's comments. Uh, as a result, OIR reviewed the substance of between two and 3,000 proposed and final rules each year, which gave them tremendous amounts of influence. And that's on top of the four to 6,000 paperwork reduction request, that re or paperwork request that, re that came in every year. In 1985, uh, OIR's responsibilities expanded even more. President Reagan issued Executive Order 12498, which essentially required agencies to uh, submit a regulatory program to OMB for review, and agencies were prohibited from publishing a rule unless their, their rule was in that program. So OMB got sort of advance notice of what agencies were going to be able to do. Now, these actions were controversial uh, at the time, were very controversial, both in terms of separation of powers concerns, I mean, who is OIRA to tell the agencies what to do when Congress has told them what to do, uh, and also in transparency concerns. There were concerns then that rules were going into OIRA, it was a black box, something happened, and either they came out or they didn't, we didn't know what happened in the box. Um, so anyway, in 1983, GAO um, did a report that, that basically concluded that, that Congress should amend uh, the Paperwork Act to um, prohibit OIRA from doing substantive regulatory reviews because it was, in, it was interfering with their statutory responsibilities under the Paperwork Act. So the expansion of responsibilities under the executive order, GAO said, were, ex, were inhibiting their statutory responsibilities, but that recommendation was never, never done. By the late 80s, though, it was much more accepted. ACUS had issued recommendations recognizing presidential review as well as the National Academy of Public Administration. The next big inflection point was in 1993 when President Clinton issued Executive Order 12866, which I happen to have a copy of right here, and it's still in effect. Executive Order 12866 revoked the two Reagan orders and, uh, and changed the way that OIRA does its business in several ways. One was it reduced the number of rules that it reviewed from all rules to only those actions that are significant. So it went from two or 3,000 rules a year that they were reviewing to about five to 700, allowing them to focus their, their resources on those more important rules. It also reaffirmed the quote unquote, the primacy of the agencies in, in rulemaking, decision making, and it in, imposed some transparency requirements in OIRA that had sort of been in, informally adopted in 1986 uh, when, uh, when OIRA's um, authority was, uh, was reaffirmed and, and when the head of OIRA was then made a presidential appointee uh, subject to Senate confirmation. Um, the, uh, in, in 2007, President George W. Bush issued another executive order, 13422, which, among other things, expanded OIRA's review to guidance documents. Um, and uh, although some contended that OIRA had always reviewed guidance documents. Interestingly, when President Obama came in in January 2009, he revoked that executive order. But then two months later, the director of OMB issued a memorandum to the agencies telling them to keep sending guidance documents over. So it was kind of interesting. Um, OIRA has also changed not so much in terms of the executive orders that are issued from time to time, but by the nature of the presidencies and the OIRA administrators that they appoint. Uh, for example, under o OIRA under Sally Katzen during the Clinton administration was largely considered a counselor to the agencies, uh, coordinating and assisting them in terms of agency rulemaking. In contrast, OIRA under John Graham uh, during the George W. Bush administration referred to itself as a gatekeeper, uh, keeping the agencies to, uh, from publishing what were termed bad rules. So there's a, there's a huge difference in the way that OIRA operates even under a single executive order. OIRA has also changed greatly in, in size over time. In 1981, there were four, uh, 90 FTE in OIRA, and uh, by 1997, though, it was down to 47. 
and actually it's 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 been usually between 50 and 55 since since 2003 um, OIRA also has several other statutory and other executive order responsibilities that, for example, they're required to do an annual report on the cost and benefits of all rules, an annual report on the unfunded mandates reform act implementation. Uh, they're, they're required to serve on panels, these Sabrifa advocacy review panels. So they have a bunch of other things they do in addition to this, but their, their primary focus is on the paperwork reviews and the substance of the rules. Now, I, I can also talk uh, ad, ad nauseum and, uh, about uh, the work that was done at GAO. When I was at GAO, I spent 23 years at GAO looking at, at OIRA uh, uh, from time to time and also uh, at CRS, but we can save that for that. I think my seven minutes are up. So that's 30 years and seven minutes. So uh, our, our next speaker is Susan Dudley, who I've already introduced, so I'll just let you take okay. it away. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me. What I thought I would do in my seven minutes is talk a little bit about OIRA's role. And my perspective is from, I was administrator during the last two years of the Bush administration, but I was also on the career staff of OIRA. So I've been there with Executive Order 12291 and 12498 and kind of have seen it from both sides. Um, and then also offer some ways that I think would be effective at improving transparency and accountability and regulation. Um, so OIRA's super regulators, as Daniel calls them, is a staff of about 50. I think Curtis said that at the end. They went from 90 to, to it's about 50, a little over 50 now, um, in OMB. And they review um, regulatory information collection and also statistical activities of executive branch agencies, so not the independent agencies. Um, and in doing that, OIRA's role is, is like that of their budget counterparts or the other parts of OMB in budget and management and legislative, and that's to uh, provide the president with a tool to manage federal agencies' natural propensity to want more, whether it's more budget resources, more autonomy in legislative matters, more information about private citizens, or more regulatory authority. And so in doing that, OIRA wears two hats. Um, one is providing what President Obama has called a dispassionate and analytical second opinion on agencies' actions. It, with its cross-cutting perspective and its focus on understanding trade-offs and consequences, OIRA tends to be less susceptible than the line, line agencies to special interest pressures. It coordinates regulatory policy so it minimizes conflict and duplication across agencies, um, and it also provides an expertise in policy analysis, economic statistics, risk analysis, and decision science. I should add law to that. Um, and the analytical principles that OIRA applies are generally not controversial, and I would say certainly not partisan. Um, they've remained essentially the same since OIRA's founding. Um, Curtis mentioned a few differences between the um, Reagan executive order and the Clinton executive order under which OIRA continues to operate, but the essential principles have stayed, philosophy and principles have stayed the same. Then OIRA also wears the second hat, and that is that it's charged with ensuring that regulatory decisions are, pres are consistent with the president's, the elected president's policy. Um, and in doing that, the career staff at OIRA work very closely, not only with their counterparts in the regulatory agencies, but also with political officials in the White House. Um, and I would say that both of those roles, getting to the topic of the conference, enhance transparency and accountability in regulation. One of the things that Curtis mentioned was a regulatory program. Um, we now have a regulatory agenda where agencies submit, and Curtis mentioned it gave OMB an early look at agencies' rulemakings, but it also gives the public an early look. So um, every six months, the government comes out with an agenda of upcoming regulatory actions with a timeline. That, that's a transparent thing. Um, as an expert evaluator of agency regulatory proposals and analysis, OIRA encourages agencies to develop and rely on quality regulatory impact analyses. And maybe we'll have a chance to talk more about that. Um, but a good RIA, a regulatory impact analysis, provides a transparent accounting of the information that's available on the need for and consequences of regulatory proposals and alternatives. It's an extremely useful framework for decision making because in doing a good RIA, you, lay, you identify the underlying problem that you're trying to solve. 
Um, you identify and evaluate alternative solutions, regulatory and non-regulatory, um, and you organize that information in a consistent, coherent, and comprehensive way. So I would argue that regulatory impact analysis itself is um, probably one of the most reliable methods for ensuring transparency in regulatory decisions. And then OIRA's second role as defender of the elected president's um, policies, while it does occasionally conflict with the first role, and if you'd like, we can talk more about that afterwards, um, but it's still, it's a very important role, it's an appropriate role, and it ensures that regulations are accountable to voters. The Constitution vests all executive authority in the President of the United States, and OMB provides many of the tools, the different parts of OMB, for enabling a President to exercise that authority. Um, so, I mean, the U.S. could hardly be a democracy if regulators didn't have to answer to elected officials. So in both of those roles, with but wearing both of those hats, I think OIRA helps to counteract the natural tendency of regulatory agencies to be captured by the concentrated special interests who seek to influence agency decisions. Um, there have been recommendations over OIRA's 30 plus year history that Curtis has documented that would require um, OIRA staff or right, to document interactions, to document um, their conversations or interactions with agency staff. I think that is misguided for several reasons. First, I don't think it would increase transparency in the regulatory process, and it would also disrupt constructive, open dialogue among members of, of the executive branch. OIRA already operates in a more transparent manner than most of the government. Um, I'm looking at Reef Bull, who operates within ACUS, and you guys have to be even more transparent, <laughs> um, but, mo but more than most agencies. It, it discloses on its website any meetings that it has with outside parties on regulations under review. It identifies all regulations for which review is ongoing or concluded. Also, you can find that on OIRA's website. And once a regulation is published, um, OIRA makes available or will make available the draft version of the regulation that was originally submitted to OIRA for review, as well as the post-review version, so that if you're interested, you can track and see what changes were made during that review process. And I think these procedures, plus the regulatory impact analysis and regulatory agenda that we talked about, contribute greatly to transparency in regulatory development. Um, and so misguided attempts at a, a fishbowl type of transparency would focus debate on who said what to whom rather than on the substance of the decisions and the supporting documentation for why those decisions were made. Um, I also think that such constraints would actually lead to less transparency rather than more. The President's staff need to be able to engage in deliberative discussions. And if those discussions cannot be coordinated by OIRA, they're still going to happen. I mean, those discussions have to happen, but they're going to be less transparent because they'll be conducted in a different way. Um, so I think Rather than, since I know there are a lot of congressional staffers in the room, um, rather than focusing on what different people in the executive branch say to each other, Congress could do more to improve the regulatory process by taking a more active role. And I'll just offer in my closing comments my um, suggestion of what I think would be the best way. And that is for Congress to have its own congressional office responsible for regulatory analysis and oversight. Um, just as the Congressional Budget Office enhances transparency and accountability <coughs> by providing independent estimates of the on-budget costs of legislation and federal programs, a congressional regulatory staff could increase transparency and accountability by doing independent al analysis of the likely effects um, of new regulation and legislative proposals. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you've given us a lot to talk about for the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to move on to Michael, please. Thank you. So I'm going to give you the uh, democratic perspective on OIRA, uh, having served for the first three years of this administration uh, as one of the managers of the office, along with Cass Sunstein, and for about two and a half years in the Clinton administration with the administrator then, Sally Katzen, who was one of the architects of uh, 12866, which is sort of the current constitution of the regulatory review process, although I think Cass would also say that 13563 is a, is a co-constitution at this point. Um, 
And you know, while Susan and I um, have you know, met over drinks and can probably agree that we don't agree on many policy issues, um, and probably approach the regulatory world from different perspectives, I think there's a big area of commonality that we share, um, and that is we both believe strongly in the value of the OIRA uh, regulatory review process. We believe strongly in the uh, importance of the office, and we believe deeply in the competence of the career staff that are the, the glue, the foundation that operates this office from administration to administration. It's important for people to understand when they uh, think about the much caricatured OIRA and OIRA process that it is essentially staffed by career civil servants who, and I will say this under oath and under a polygraph exam, in six years of experience have never sensed a political agenda in any of them. They are, um, I don't know if I can use the word pains in the rear, uh, maybe I'll say it that way, um, to agencies and others because they ask tough questions. They can be skeptics, and that's their job. Their job is to provide a rigorous screening process for the most important policy decisions that the executive branch makes. The executive branch makes policy primarily through regulation. And these regulations, these policies can impact people to the immense good and also can harm people. And they have to be done right. This isn't some you know, idle exercise. The agencies have expertise, huge expertise, but like with everything in our lives, it helps to have someone else review our work. And I can hardly think of an area of professional life in which work product is not made better because somebody else who's more objective and more separate from the creation of the project has a chance to review it. And that is, in essence, what the OIRA review process is and does. And the folks who carry it out administration to administration are dedicated professionals uh, who ask, I think, the same questions administration to administration. Now, Clearly, administrations have different views of regulation. That's why we have national elections. And I won't for a moment sit here and tell you that George W. Bush and Barack Obama didn't have a different view uh, towards regulation. Of course they did. They should. Uh, we have a two-party system, at least in this country. Bill Clinton had a different view of regulation than George Bush did. But OIRA actually is one of the few institutions, I think, that stays essentially the same from administration to administration. Now, there is variation, for sure, but they tend to operate between the 40-yard lines, and that's because they carry out the same process. George W. Bush operated his presidency under the executive order that Bill Clinton signed. Okay? He made some minor <coughs> changes to it in 2006, but essentially it was the same process, and this president has continued it. And it's done by many of the same people. When I joined the Obama administration, I'd say 25 to 30 percent of the OIRA staff were folks I had worked with when I left OIRA in 1997. So there's an institutional stability and consistency to OIRA that I think is a huge value. Now, Susan and Cass and I and Sally and John Graham clearly had some different views at the policy level but so do the heads of the EPA, so do the heads of the Domestic Policy Council, so do the heads of the NEC and the Department of Interior. Presidents appoint political officials throughout the White House and in the agencies who have different views. But again, that's why we have elections. I don't think that that uh, speaks to a, a vastly different OIRA process uh, between administrations. I would note that more rules have changed under this administration than the last. I think withdrawals are probably essentially the same, and return letters are fewer. That speaks to a huge impact, um, I think, to the good, net, uh, on regulation as it goes through the process with slightly different emphases on the tools. And I think democratic administrations tend to utilize return letters less, but change rules as much as mo or more and have um, many, many withdrawals. And those are the, the various levers that, uh, that, that one uses in uh, the review process. Now, let me speak to uh, caricature. Well, before I do that, let, let me just highlight um, in descending order I, what I think is so critical about our review. And I saw numerous instances 
in which things were caught in each of these buckets or domains that would not have been but for the process. The first is, is the rule constitutional? You'd be surprised. That issue actually comes up on occasion and is actually a relevant one. Second, is it lawful under the statute that delegated the authority of the agency? Even more frequently, real issues about that arise and are fully ventilated in the, in the OIRA review process. Mind you, when the rule comes over in proposed form, the agency's already determined that it is lawful, but quite often it's found either not to be or more often, let's say, the rule is modified to ensure its legality under the statute. Uh, is it consistent with presidential priorities? That seems fair. The president has appointed all of the non-independent agency heads who can be removed at will. These are people he uh, and one day she have placed at the heads of agencies to run them. It seems to me fair that uh, the president views each rulemaking of significance as consistent with his presidential agenda and priorities. Uh, are there interagency conflicts? Where else are we going to resolve those but through a real process of interagency review? And there are many because Congress has seen fit over the decades to delegate the same enforcement and regulatory authority or this, the authority in domains like food safety or environment, for instance, to many different agencies. And so it's, a, it's an important issue. Uh, are the rules analytically sound? And uh, have the agencies thought through all of the unintended consequences and the alternative paths? Uh, those are all important uh, equities that I think are, are vindicated in the OIRA process. In terms of caricature, and I've experienced this twice uh, in OIRA, it is an amazing thing to come to work every day and be blasted by the left and the right simultaneously. Uh, the, uh, the, the center left thinks that OIRA does its job altogether too well uh, and is a quote unquote killing ground for regulations, which of course it's not because 90 plus percent of all regulations move forward. Uh, center right, many in the business community feels like OIRA stumbles and falls down and doesn't do enough to stop um, you know, um, phantom regulatory tsunamis. What's interesting is when you have the right and the left both attacking you, it's a pretty good indication you're doing your job right, in my view, in the OIRA process. And that's because OIRA takes them as they come. They look at each transaction as a transaction, the facts of the transaction, the circumstances of the transaction, and it is a surprisingly non-political uh, process within a very political world. Uh, let me close with just a few uh, thoughts uh, on, on OIRA and how it could be made better. First, the resource issue is real. Uh, OIRA used to have 90 FTEs. Now it actually has under 50 functioning FTEs. Uh, and its work is as important or more important than ever. In fact, it keeps being asked to do new responsibilities, say in the area of international regulatory cooperation and others, precisely because its staff is so competent that people at the White House immediately recognize that OIRA is a place that gets things done and gets them done right. <laughs> But they can't do their jobs as well over time if they don't have sufficient FTEs. So m I think OIRA needs more support, not less. Uh, second, um, a a an area in which they might get more support is, uh, and I'm just going to throw this in the middle of the ring here for a little discussion, um, is, is the area of independent agency regulation. Um, I just throw this out as a discussion item because there's uh, legislation that's been introduced recently by Senators Portman and Warner, uh, which would authorize the president to issue an executive order that would create a similar but not precisely uh, 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 ex uh, similar uh, process for independent agencies as they have with non-independents. I think it's an interesting question and debate uh, as to whether um, the EPA should send a billion dollar rule through this process, but uh, independent agency should not. Now there are differences for sure, and the legislation tries to accommodate those. It would be a non-binding review, and there would be transparency as opposed to an ability to really um, you know, slow the rule down or send it back. Um, but anyway, it's worth uh, a discussion. If that were to happen though, a condition precedent that is necessary, it would be for OIRA to get more resources. And then finally on transparency, this is a very, very tough and interesting question. Um, on the one hand, OIRA has probably the most transparent process 
in the rulemaking process and the White House for sure in terms of policy making. Um, it, 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 you know in real time when rules are under a WIRA review. Uh, it has an open door to anyone from the public to come in and meet and discuss a rule. Those meetings, the participants and any materials left behind are publicly docketed. The before and after versions of the rule are made available and even some communications between a wire and the agency are made public. You don't see that when a budget is formed. You don't see that when policy councils in the White House meet to develop policy and you sure don't see that on a lot of behind the scenes um, regulatory and other policy development at agencies. So, if we're going to talk about <clears throat> transparency, I think we have to start by acknowledging that the OIRA process is actually quite transparent already. Having said that, <clears throat> I think it, it's interesting to explore ways in which the process could be made a little bit more transparent that wouldn't undermine the, the important deliberative protections uh, that the process requires. And rather than talk about that now, because my time is done, I will save that for later. Thank you very much. Please. I guess my job is to give you what's been preemptively described as the cartoonish view of OIRA. <laughs> Didn't mean to set you up like that. Perhaps. <laughs> um, so I think a starting point way to look at OIRA is to frame it within the broader rulemaking process. And I think um, there are obviously, as Michael pointed out, different takes on how the rulemaking process is proceeding. But from public citizens' view, and I think pretty broadly across the public interest community, the rulemaking process is quite profoundly broken. I think OIRA is part of that story. It's not all of it for sure, but I think it's an important, important part of it. And the reason I think it's broken is I think that actually the process starting within the agencies is far too tilted in favor of industry interests and lobbyists who are able to vastly overwhelm the public on, and public interest groups on all uh, rulemaking processes with a handful of high profile exceptions, um, all the way through to after rules are promulgated where there's another bite at the apple, not at OIRA, after it's done uh, in the courts with, with rules many of them judicially imposed that are very favorably um, tilted in favor of regulated interests. So there's sort of an industry bias from the start to the end and a lot of choke points for industry, a lot of new uh, administrative requirements imposed on regulatory agencies that delay the rulemaking process and then some up through OIRA. Uh, we did a study this past June that looked at rules with statutory mandates for issuance. So not where someone petitioned or, or there's actually an objective need, but where Congress instructed regulatory agencies to issue rules by date certain. And the regulatory agencies fail, or at least the administration at the end of the day fails, in more than half the occasions um, to meet congressionally imposed deadlines. A lot of those are Dodd-Frank rules, but only about 40%. So it's not just the Dodd-Frank story. And that, I think, is an indication of a rulemaking process that's not functioning properly. OIRA is an important part of that story. OIRA is part of the delay story, but it is more, um, but it extends well beyond, I think, the delays that are, while rules are housed at OIRA. And I think procedure, look, these guys know far, far more than me about how things work, and I don't think there's any sort of factual disagreement, but I think there, we might characterize the process quite differently. Um, the, the methodology of OIR, the sort of the Susan, um, the RAs that Susan's talking about, or cost benefit analysis, uh, either depending on your point of view, theoretically or, or at least in my view, as applied, tend to be very favorable um, towards business interests. They tend to underestimate co benefits systematically and overestimate costs, and I think that's revealed um, by a retrospective look at how rules actually work once they're adopted. OIRA is, so the process is that rules are, you know, handed over to the agency, handed from the agency to OIRA for review, supposedly within a 90-day or up to 120-day review process. Th that review process is quite frequently um, extended and the, de and the deadline missed, but that only think only gets to part of the delay story and part of the OIRA influence story, and I'm sure that they agree with this, um, which is to say there's an ongoing conversation between the agencies and OIRA as rules are being developed, and the agencies develop rules against the backdrop of how they can satisfy 
OIRA, both in terms of the actual conversations and also in terms of knowing that at the end of the day, once they put the rule forward, if it's not going to satisfy OIRA, it's not going to pass muster. So they're going to have to craft it in the first place. So I think the OIRA influence into the process is very pervasive um, and I think exacerbates the, the kind of underlying concerns that I was highlighting in the first place. To take just, um, I should say one other, one other point about this, which is that, you know, that OIRA is involved both in this, the, the significant rules, those that are valued at $100 million a year or more impact, which turns out to be actually a pretty low threshold um, if you think about what, how that plays out, but also in, in hundreds of others that it chooses to get involved in um, through creative statutory or executive order interpretation. So OIRA's influence is really quite pervasive. In 2003, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration started a rulemaking process to develop a rule to limit worker exposure to silica. Rule has been, rule was finalized um, from OSHA and handed over to IRA more than 18 months ago, and it's stuck at OIRA. Um, transparently or not, it's stuck, and for reasons that I would say are not so, so clearly transparent, although maybe Michael will elaborate for us. Um, <laughs> about, uh, you know, well over 500 people have died from silico exposure since that rulemaking process started. More than 20,000 people have contracted non-fatal silicosis since that rulemaking process was started. So there are really quite severe consequences to these kinds of delay, which may well turn into just rejection, of course, at the end of the day, or maybe not. Who knows? Um, so I would say that's our take. In terms of thinking about reform, I mean, we'll have a conversation about some of the things that were proposed, but I think a, a way forward for OIRA would be to move away, actually, from the the case-by-case, rule-by-rule review. I don't agree with Susan's contention that OIRA is independent um, of the special interests that might influence the process. I think that OIRA, I think that those, I think the agencies are not biased towards ex expanding their regulatory powers. I think by and large the agencies are biased towards the regulatory, the regulated industries that they regulate, um, which is a pretty widely shared conception of, of the problem of regulatory capture. Um, but I also think that the, the entity of OIRA, see, and they haven't even done enough to regulate cell phones. If we just had this automatic stop-off thing, then people wouldn't be embarrassed at meetings like this would be fine. Um, the, the, the OIRA, there is a, this open door policy that OIRA has does mean that they end up meeting with business interests like five, six times more than they do with public interest groups. But I think that the actual, the regulatory approach effect, uh, inherently favors regulated business interests, the same regulated business interests that have too much power in the regulatory agencies in the first place. So it's really much more of a, of a, lay, of a overlay pro of the underlying problem rather than an offset counterbalance from our point of view. So the, I think the approach, therefore, would be, that would be very interesting and really resp responsive to huge actually existing regulatory problems would be to move away from reviewing agencies that don't do a good enough job anyway and complain about them doing, um, being too tough on the industries when it's usually the opposite. And instead saying, like, what are the, how does the regulatory system work and what are the big regulatory holes and how there are issues about regulatory coordination. There are massive issues of regulatory gaps. There are huge issues of regulatory capture and massive things that we don't regulate at all, um, including you know, chemical exposure um, for workers, chemical exposure for consumers, chemical exposure in the environment and the interaction between chemicals, just to take one not so trivial example. Um, that is a hard problem, and it's not something that, that's really getting sufficient attention. Uh, that, I think, would be a, a, a really good way forward to sort of think about how you have this thing that this entity that is trying to coordinate and have a big picture view and take the big picture view rather than looking at these individual case by case things where the, where, where the specialized agencies have more effect. Absent that, um, I think the, you know, a way forward has to be at least more transparency um, and more and some kind of critical re assessment of why it is that the, that the OI review is always that the regulation is too tough. Um, 
That's unfair. Not, it's not that always too tough, but where changes are made, the changes are always made in the direction that it was too tough of the regulated industry rather than, than too weak. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> now the fun part. So I, I think the first thing I'd like to pick up on, uh, with the exception, uh, I think, of a comment that Susan made, was that I didn't really hear Congress mentioned all that much in our conversation here. I mean, we, we heard a lot about uh, the president and, you know, elections have consequences and, and reflecting the, the views of the administration and things along those, those lines. But there, there hasn't yet been a conversation uh, about, one, that these agencies are not just created by the executive, but that Congress has a role in both creating them and creating statutory requirements for them to follow. And then sort of a, a second piece of that, of course, is as that agencies go through the rulemaking process. Uh, and OIRA goes through the process of reviewing those rulemakings, that some of the transparency isn't just for the American people, as valuable as that is, of course, but it's for Congress to see what's going on as well. And now, of course, they have oversight cap capabilities to do that, but if you're looking at it from a, from a broader perspective, whether it's the uh, uh, creating a, a CBO-like entity that, that is, in, you know, or CRS-like entity that basically looks at the federal regulations, there doesn't seem to be that same kind of easy window into what's going into o OIRA. But maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. So that's, that's why we're having this conversation. And I see you. I'm reaching you know. for my microphone. Okay, please go ahead. And <laughs> Did you have more questions first? Or? No, please go ahead. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And I do, I would love to see Congress be more involved. I think Congress, and again, I'm waiting for tomatoes from the congressional staff and the audience to come flying my way. But I think Congress has, um, Congress is able to pass a statute with a goal that everybody agrees with. So a statute like, um, what's the Dodd-Frank, the name of the Dodd-Frank bill, it's in reform, yeah. Hmm? Wall Street reform. Wall Street reform, I mean, we, want them, we want that. Um, but then with the details, then they just pass on to the executive branch to fill out the details and actually issue the regulations. And when the regulations tick off their constituents, well, it's the agency's fault. It's not my fault. So Congress really is not very accountable. And so the, I would love to see Congress take more accountability. In terms of um, your question about transparency about OIRA, I'm, I'm not sure why transparency about a, what OIRA, what one office in the government is doing is more important than transparency about the, the factors behind the regulation. Why would you stop at asking for transparency between what OIRA says to um, and actually they don't speak to agencies on Dodd-Frank regulations, so to FDA, and not wonder what FDA staff say to USDA staffs. I, I'm just not sure what the value of, of knowing what went on, and I think the downsides to, to, um, to documenting those interactions are much greater than the benefits. I don't think it would get you any greater transparency in regulation than Congress has now, because you have the unified agenda, you know when regulations are, are expected to come out, you know, um, just as Rob knew that the crystalline silica rule has been seen at OIRA for over a year, I'm also curious why it's there, so maybe we can buy Michael another drink afterwards <laughs> and find out. Um, so I'm curious why it's there, but we know it's there. We would have no idea where that regulation was if it weren't for OIRA's tra transparency. And, um, just what Michael made a comment about there are fewer return letters. Well, if I were returned to that regulation, it would be very transparent what the problems with it were because that's what return letters said. They said, we are sending this back to you because you did not comply with the following elements of Executive Order 12866. So there's a transparency element in a return letter. Um, although I can tell you from personal experiences, agencies don't like to get them. So more often than not, a threat, I, I would guess, and again, I don't think we'll get Michael to tell us, I would bet a lot of return letters have been drafted, shown to an agency head, and the agency head said, never mind, I'll withdraw that regulation, thank you very much. I don't want that public record of why you sent it back. So let, let me push you a little bit on, on this point, if you don't mind. So I, I went and did a little bit of homework before I, before I came here, and there was actually Curtis's report, there were two GAO reports, uh, and there was a report from the Center for Progressive Reform. And all of them uh, took OIRA to task in different ways for how it's making, it, how it's making it information available. But just starting off with the executive order itself, 
Uh, it requires, of course, each agency to identify in public in a complete, clear, and simple manner the substance of changes between the draft submitted to OIR for review and the action subsequently announced, which is something that you spoke about in your opening remarks. And then there's also the requirement of the publicly available log, which is that uh, any communications between OIRA and the public, not, not folks inside the, uh, employed by the executive branch, they, they need to disclose the status of all regulatory actions, the dates and names of individuals involved in substantive oral communications, make available all documents exchanged between OIRA and the agency during the review. Um, GAO, when they looked at this, uh, so in 2009, for example, um, they made a number of recommendations and they found that, generally speaking, OIRA was not doing these, at least in the way that it viewed it, that the uh, EO intended. Um, in that they said, you know, we made these recommendations six, seven years ago, and of course they, you know, OIRA said that we would look at them and then sort of didn't look at them. So uh, and there's also a report that came out from the Center for Progressive Reform that sort of made, uh, that was a recent analysis that basically found sort of the same kinds of things that a lot of the work was being done either in the informal process before the rules were going there, so the public wouldn't even necessarily see what was going on until at least in their view. Uh, many of the determinations had already been made that if you look at what's on the website, for example, it's very difficult to look at the disclosure of the meeting and tie it to a particular rulemaking because the RIN isn't there, uh, so you can't really make that kind of connection. Uh, I, just for sort of entertainment value, uh, late last week went and looked at a number of the disclosures. Mm -hmm. And a number of the agencies that presumably were being reviewed, they had no disclosures up there for two, three, four, five years. Uh, maybe it's because that particular component didn't have something going through review, or maybe it's because it's not being disclosed in the, in the way that uh, it could be. And sort of one of the other criticisms that came up in at least a couple of different places is that there was great use, well, one is that there were a lot of technical problems. So like people's names were misspelled so you couldn't figure out who they were. Or entities that they worked at, you couldn't figure it out. So if I went and met with OIRA, uh, my name would be misspelled and they, instead of the Sunlight Foundation, they might say the Sunshine Foundation or, or something like that. Uh, but in addition to the sort of technical problems, there, were, there was also, you know, despite the order that talks about clear, simple language, that it was very jargony, that it was very difficult for folks to understand. Um, you know, difficult to understand the rule? Difficult to understand the communications that took place. So, you know, it would, for example, it would say something like um, uh, a conversation regarding, and there would be some sort of a jargony acronym that you wouldn't necessarily know what it was unless you knew what the rule, the underlying rule itself was. This is with outside parties or with? This is with outside parties, That's yes. probably how they... Which is probably, yeah. probably just how and they tracked it in turn. I mean, yeah. right. Let me actually, and let me... Start I, I, yeah. I, I actually have an illustration that... Um, Michael may, well, he may find it interesting as well. Um, first of all, OIRA is rather scrupulous about when they hold those meetings, those meetings with people outside, they, they're very scrupulous about, they, they um, OIRA staff call it reading them their rights. So if you've ever gone in, so the OIRA staff says, we, this is a listening session, we're here to listen to what you have to say but not tell you anything about the regulation. We've invited the agency, the issuing agency, to be with us so that they can also hear anything you show us we will put on the public record. So that's the reading them their rights. And then they do come back and they try to post it right away. If somebody scribbles their name, it's too, they don't go through it. They probably don't go through and ask them to, could you clarify um, how you spell Daniel? But, um, but one thing I think that's interesting, and this is maybe the unintended consequences of transparency, and I fully support for that, but that was something that, as Curtis mentioned, was part of executive order, um, 12866, which was um, President Clinton signed in 1993, um, when um, in 2001 the internet have, had come along enough that um, John Graham and probably Paul Noe said, well, gee, we shouldn't just keep a record of these that people can come and look at in our reading room. We should post it on our website. So they started posting on the website these meetings. So there's nothing in 12866 that says put it on the web. When that happened, when I was at OIRA in the 80s, I never once had a meeting with anybody from industry, industry on a regulation. Never once. There was one legislative proposal I worked on that I did, but never once on regulation. When I came back in 2007, I was stunned at the number of those meetings that we had. And you can see why when it's on the website. First on the website is when the regulation is under review, which is the signal that OIRA's door is open because OIRA will not meet with you outside of that window, as a general matter anyway. Um, 
so the, the door is open, and then you see that lobbyists for a different view than yours have met with OIRA. And so, well, certainly if your other, if this other guy is, if you're going to make your 200 or $800 an hour, you need to go in and meet with OIRA. And it is just, um, I think the number of regulations, I'd love to hear what Michael thinks about pre, uh, when he was there the first time, if there are a lot more of those meetings than there were before. So the, if the concern is that a wire is uh, uh, you know, talking too much to, to int people who are interested in a, uh, a regulation, well, that transparency procedure sure expanded how often a wire meets with them. So I'd, I'd like to go to Michael, but first I want to go to Curtis just to make sure that I'm not <laughs> entirely off base in, in what I'm saying. No, uh, you're, you're right. Uh, I did the GAO review nine years ago that he mentioned, uh, and GAO made nine recommendations to improve the transparency of o OIRA review, and OIRA has really only implemented one of them. Uh, and, it was, and it's about the, the public meetings with outside parties. They're actually doing a, a better job in terms of documenting uh, when they meet with someone, who was there at their meeting, what organizations that they represent, and so forth. But I also did a little playing on the internet before I got here, <laughs> and uh, and found some interesting things. But the the, the primary um, takeaway in terms of rec of transparency from this report was that OIRA really doesn't do one review of a rule. They often do multiple reviews of rules. They do an informal review and then for some of the big rules, and then they do a formal review. Formal review is when the agency formally submits a Form 83R to OIRA and formally submits the rule for review. But OIRA would often review drafts of rules for big rules, EPA rules in particular, months in advance, and those were not covered by the transparency requirements. So any changes that were made to a rule during informal review were never documented. And that's a big thing because, as John Graham said in 2001, uh, 2, and 3, they get most of the changes from the agencies during the informal reviews, but they don't, the agencies were told not to document the changes that were made. That's not transparency. That's, not, that's what GAO said in 2003, and also in 2009 when they issued this report following up on that. The, uh, the other thing is the, date, the risk database, the, um, the database that's used to document the changes that were made. And, and Michael mentioned how often rules are changed. Well, the, the category in that database is consistent with change. And consistent with change can mean that OIRA gutted the rule, or it can mean that the agency changed a comma. You don't know what it means. So, it, you know, the rule changed between the time it was formally submitted and the time that it came out. But you don't know the, who, who changed it, whether it was OIRA or the agencies, and you don't know the level of the change. Uh, withdrawn is another category in the database, but as GAO documented in 2003, uh, most rules that are withdrawn are withdrawn at the instigation of OIRA, not by the agency. So what does withdrawn mean? We don't know. Um, the time it takes for OIRA to review, again, that's only the formal review period. So how long does it take OIRA to review a rule? The average is 41 days for formal review. Well, we don't know how long for informal review. Oral communications are documented. It's a category on the OIRA database. And I did look around. <clears throat> According to the OIRA database, there have been no oral communications with outside parties regarding any, any EPA error radiation rules since 2002. <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, you really? I mean, Why would you not believe that? Because there have been so many <laughs> rules. Well, it's, I mean, there have yeah, been no oral. I mean, Moira won't pick up the phone and, or answer the phone on a regulation under review. It does not do it. If you want to talk to Moira about a regulation, you have to come in and do that on the, that. It's okay. A, okay. You, know, you have to be read your rights. That's so, possible. <laughs> then it's, oh, so, I mean, I think you should actually believe that it's true. No oral communications with the Department of Transportation as a whole since 2002, or, or regarding a DOT rule. No, no conversations with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services since 2006. That's what it shows on the, D, on the OIRA website. I mean, but, I mean, oral communications between With outside OIRA. parties I, regarding one no, of those no, agencies' no, I don't rules. Think, look, can I jump in now? I think we've had a long <laughs> litany of... Uh, of, yes, of, of issues here. Okay, so just no, informal review. First of all, Curtis, um, and I love you, Curtis. I love, those, <laughs> I love those reports. But those are current up to 2003 and 2009, okay? I'm not, Susan, you can speak for the last administration. Informal rulemaking, uh, in, informal reviews occur very rarely. 
in this administration. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, th there, there was a concerted effort uh, in this OMB and at the agencies to drastically reduce instances of uh, informal reviews. And uh, I think it, is, it was at least uh, very successful mm -hmm. in, uh, at least during my tenure there. Um, the consistent with change, I, I don't really see the problem. Uh, the rule changed, and you can find out how it changed by looking at the rule. Let it's me not going to happen that you can unpack, first of all, how much it changed and whether or not it was gutted or not is somewhat of a subjective determination. Second of all, who made the change and why it was made and how it was made, uh, I think, first of all, strays into deliberative uh, process and is, would be very damaging to the process to reveal. Second, it's not always clear why and how a particular change was made. If you haven't worked in the process, it's very hard to understand that it is a very organic, complex set of discussions between multiple agencies, multiple offices at the White House, and the issuing agency. And oftentimes, changes are made well, uh, by the agency. Oftentimes, they're strongly suggested uh, by the White House or other offices. And to unpack the provenance, so to speak, of every particular change, I think, um, does not pass cost-benefit muster, in my view, in terms of the value of the process. Withdrawn, the rule is withdrawn. I think that is, it means what it says means the agency has decided to withdraw the rule. And there's been a determination made. The agency doesn't have to, but the agency has made a determination to remove the rule from review. In my experience, that was most often because the agency came to the realization that there was either substantial concern by multiple White House offices and other agencies with the approach taken, or a real realization that they hadn't done enough work to justify the approach they were taking or analyzed other approaches. There were serious questions that remained about the rulemaking. And in terms of the time, um, it is about 40-something days, generally. Uh, people keep repeating this 120-day deadline uh, for review. That's actually an incorrect reading of the executive order. It's 90 days, and then there can be a 30-day extension uh, at the request of the OIR administrator, but an extension of unlimited duration uh, at the request and agreement of the issuing agency. And so most every rule that you see that's at OIRA for more than 120 days is there because the agency has agreed. Maybe they're not real happy about it, <laughs> but understand here, um, the rule may be having major impacts on society and there are real concerns about the rulemaking, so the conversation is continuing. And um, that rule is still at OIRA under an extension of, in, of, of, of indefinite length, and that's transparent. Trust me, the folks at OIRA don't relish rules that are on their clock and at their office for 160, 200, 250 days because they pride themselves in moving rules through review. Uh, I, I would note that almost every rule that goes into review, 90, probably 90% 90 of the rules that go through review pass through review and are ultimately enacted and uh, or finalized. And I, I, you know, I, again, I just find it, I'm sorry, I find it unremarkable that in a government that puts out four to 6,000 regulations a year and six to 700 significant regulatory actions every year, that you would not find um, some portion of those that the administration, the president, and his senior advisors and other agencies, other senior political officials at other agencies would find is not the right approach to tackle that problem. And so I, I guess because I saw so many rules go through, because I have heard so often from industry um, uh, about uh, how upset they were with uh, the OIRA process and the OIRA and the result at the agencies, I just find it difficult to um, credit either side saying that it's either a limp noodle or is a sharp guillotine. Sorry, I just can't. I can't do it. I have so, to sit squarely in the middle of the road. So let me give this to Curtis, and then we give Rob a shot, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. 
Uh, yeah, the, the executive order says that the OIRA or the agencies are to, d to identify in a complete, clear, and simple manner and the substantive changes between the draft submitted to OIRA for review and the action subsequently announced. Talk to the agencies about that. Right. But, but OIRA basically could, and as GAO recommended, they could set, tell the agencies what sorts of disclosures need to be made. And some agencies were doing a very good job in terms of summarizing the changes in a memo. But apparently the, the policy now is, as Susan mentioned, and, and, and I think other, others have mentioned, is, is that the, the public is to see the rule as it came in and the rule as it went out. Do we have something positive to say here? I think uh, further OMB guidance on agency responsibilities under that doesn't strike me as um, crazy. I don't know what you think, Susan, but I mean, it's what OMB but I haven't, You're not, not going to comment guidance, on that. Yeah. Having looked at a 450-page rule and trying to tease out the differences between the draft as submitted and the draft as published, right. it's not easy to, and, uh, to, to find those changes. And so I'm not sure that that just providing those two documents satisfies that requirement in the executive order. You want to? Um, you know, I think one, I think some of the stuff, some of the concerns about OIRA get kind of pushed into the, the transparency frame because there's an underlying substantive consideration. And, but the reason, and I think, so let me go back to the first, you know, sort of the underlying substantive frame, which notwithstanding the fact that industry also complains, which I know is true, I don't think that that <laughs> makes it <laughs> correct that you're, you found the sweet spot. Right, but you could say the same thing about your views, too. Yeah, yeah right. of course I mean, you could. As a, as a matter, as a matter of, as a, right, as a matter of rhetoric, yeah. one could, but then you would actually want to look at what decisions I are being agree. made. You'd want to look at the underlying evidence. and You'd say, gosh, when was, well, remind me of the time that OIRA insisted that OSHA was not doing its job and should have actually hit a tougher rule. When did they say, oh, yeah, EPA is letting too much smoke into the air and they ought to cut down on it? When did they say, FD, FDA, speed up that rule on food safety? Right. Right? When was the example? The examples don't exist. So it is a one-way ratchet in the direction of industry. And there may be an example, which I don't know about, but there aren't a lot. So I think that is why people are, people, I will own it, I, others, <laughs> right, are concerned about the pervasive um, role of OIRA, and it's just, it's not, you're completely right that it's not, and obviously you're right because you know the process, but it's not just the end of the day thing. It's the OIRA, the OIRA review shades the whole process from start all the way up through. And so I think that, and it's true, as we, if, and I think you probably agree with that, don't think it's a bad thing, but agree with it. And that is why people push on the transparency, why we push on the transparency, because we find that frustrating and bad. So to the extent that it's happening, we want to be able to identify where it goes on. I just wanted to say one other thing about, maybe it'll come out in the Q&A, on, on, on Daniel's question about um, Congress, one, one piece of that, and the issue that, that, that Michael raised about um, proposed legislation to expand OIRA's review to the independent agencies. Um, I think one, there's a lot of reasons why I think that's a bad idea, which you'll be surprised to hear. But one of them is the independent agencies are independent. So they're not supposed to be accountable to the president. They're supposed to make independent determinations. Their, their, accountability, their lines of accountability are under Congress. And centralizing OIRA authority or even advisory review um, over those independent agencies, it's not really separate. It's not a constitutional issue, but it changes the, the lines of accountability in ways that I think are unhelpful and would reduce uh, congressional power and enhance centralized executive power. Great. So we're going to take questions. I, I do hope uh, that coming from the questions, hopefully will be more of a discussion of uh, some sort of the substantive changes that, you know, so Rob brought up at one point, you know, and I think this might be something that's interesting to you as well, you know, not just looking at the micro level, but looking at the macro level in terms of OIRA's role sort of more broadly, something that you discussed as well a little bit in terms of maybe setting information policy standards a little bit differently for how the agencies disclose. There are probably other things in here about the way that they do business, which I just didn't mention at this moment, that may be worthwhile uh, trying to address as we answer questions from, from folks out here as well. I was going to make a comment, but I'll put it in the form of question. <laughs> How do you have the audacity to say that chemical exposure is, unreg is, un is unregulated? I don't know where that comes from. 
in any event, the, the larger question for the, for the, for the panel is, um, if you could discuss the variety of loopholes that there are in terms of, um, you know, OIRA review, uh, particularly in light of the increase in, um, you know, financial regulations that are, that are now being done by, by uh, independent regulators and thus they're not going through the regulatory process. Anybody want to? Well, I mean, OIRA doesn't review independent regulatory agencies' um, rules. Uh, they review their information collection. So if an, if an agency rule has an information collection, OIRA would, would see it, and th but only that portion of it. Um, most of the rules under Dodd-Frank are being issued by independent regulatory agencies, SEC, CFTC, Federal Reserve, and so forth. So, so maybe, may, let me broaden the question slightly in, in two different ways. Uh, one is, is what sort of came up before, which is, uh, should there be review of, of in, independent regulatory agency actions? Uh, and sort of a, a second piece to that is that some of the criticism that's out there is that certain types of agencies, regulations are much more amenable to being reviewed than others. So that, uh, you know, they're more amenable to cost-benefit analysis or see, you know, there, there's, it's easier for them to put sort of a price on these kinds of things so that when it comes to National security, for example, it's harder to make some type of a determination. So home and security may not be reviewed in the same kind of way that EPA is reviewed and having sort of consistency across the different agencies, whether that's one, something that we should value. And if so, is there, is there a way to approach it? And Curtis, if you don't mind, I'm gonna throw you on the grenade. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think um, certainly the, the agency's rules differ in the terms of the, their ability to, to quantify the benefits. The benefit side is always the harder of the two sides. Um, and your threshold question was about whether independent regulatory agencies' rules should be reviewed by OIRA. Uh, a sort of a, a, a preceding question to that is whether or not those agencies should do cost-benefit analyses. Uh, and, uh, and certainly there are differences in the, across the agencies in terms of their statutory requirements to do uh, any type of analysis. The, cons uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, for example, is specifically required to do an analysis of cost and benefits and to publish that in the rule. Uh, in contrast, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission is, requir is required to quote unquote consider uh, various factors but cost and benefits are not among them. But nevertheless, the Securities and Exchange Commission was taken to court last year, and in the SEC, uh, the Business Roundtable versus SEC case, uh, the court in that case ruled, uh, which the, the judge was a former OIRA administrator, Doug, uh, uh, Judge Ginsburg, that uh, SEC, even though they had done a cost-benefit analysis, they hadn't done a very good one. And so therefore, they needed to do a better one. So in some cases, apparently the statute itself, even though it doesn't specifically say you have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Judges may well read that, that language to say that they have to do it. But the, 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 to, for OIRA to be involved in the process and review those agencies' rules, sort of, you know, they really need to do, have, have that sort of analysis in order to be able to do a good job in terms of figuring out what exactly the agency is doing and why they're doing it. Yeah, um, a, a couple thoughts on it. One, I think we should recognize that cost-benefit analysis or benefit-cost analysis is one component of a regulatory impact analysis. So that, that there's a lot of things that, in, as I said, it's, it's that transparent accounting of what we know. It's not just benefit-cost analysis. Um, I agree with Curtis that there are, and Daniel's point, that it is different. Different agencies, there are different analyses that you need to do. Um, it is evident, though, Resources for the Future has a, a nice paper looking at independent agencies' analysis. They do a, m executive branch agencies do a much better job of laying out for the public what the likely effects of their regulations will be. They do a much better regulatory impact analysis. Now, um, and I will agree with Rob here, that probably is, um, it's, it's one of OIRA's influences, that an agency, knowing that they're going to have to get past a wire review are going to do a better job of that analysis. Now, Rob and I disagree on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's good for the public that agencies think through what effects their regulations will have before they issue them and whether there may be a better alternative. And so in that light, I will agree with Michael that um, I think OIRA should have more staff and review independent agency regulations. You just agreed with everybody on the panel. I did. That answer, that was brilliant. I'm so agreeable. <laughs> 
Um, well, on, on, my, on the audacity question, uh, OSHA, I think, has regulated two chemicals since 1997, about two new chemicals that are put on the market every day. So that's one evidence. EPA under TOXA does not regulate um, chemicals on the same way we re regulate pharmaceuticals. It does not have a sort of a precautionary approach to it, and things get on the market all the time. Uh, you want to let me finish? So I just gave you an example of hundreds of chemicals that are on the market that are unregulated for worker safety. Hundreds of chemicals <laughs> on the market not regulated by EPA. The interaction among chemicals is unregulated by almost anybody at all. And one can say that's a concern or it's not a concern, but it's not really an audacious claim. In terms of the, the independent regulatory thing, I think you know, one, of the, one of the pieces is, I think, is an important component that Curtis said, and it's not really an OIRA issue, but it is, does speak to the broader regulatory frame on, on cost-benefit analysis, or my starting point that the system at a, a variety of choke points is, leans towards regulated industries. And in the, finan the, the decision that, that Curtis was referencing with a judicially imposed requirement for, for cost-benefit analysis on, on Dodd-Frank type rules shows some of the limitations of the methodology. And I'm mindful of what you said, Susan, it's not. This is, OIRA is not um, um, applying in this case and also has a variety of tools. But in, but in this judicial case, courts are saying that things were, in my view, does not make sense, even if you accept sort of the basic framework of cost benefit to apply it, they're saying it still does. If you think about something like the Volcker rule, which is intended to avoid excessive concentration, interconnection in the financial sector as against the risk of basically financial collapse, like what's the cost benefit analysis of that? Well, the, you could say the benefit is Infinite, is infinity because the financial collapse is basically infinity, but the risk is some you know some small amount. So what what you know a small portion of infinity it just is, it's not does not lend itself very well to cost benefit analysis. Or in the case that's involved, like share, proxy rights for shareholders. What's the value in shareholders having some say over what a corporation is going to do, or greater say over their, over corporate decision making? It doesn't lend itself very well to monetization. So I think that is a, a worrisome. Uh, perhaps trend coming from the courts. And, and there was an interesting um, analysis of that business roundtable decision in the, I think it's the summer issue of Texas Law Review called The Emperor Has No Clothes, which basically said Congress knows how to require cost-benefit analysis. They didn't do that in the SEC statute. So you, it, you can argue it both ways. You know, I'm not arguing for or against cost-benefit analysis for independent regulatory agencies. I'm just saying that the underlying statutes that Congress established are different. And, and, uh, and courts may interpret those one way or the, or the other. Final comment? Uh, sure. Just on the question of the difficulty of measuring uh, more often benefits than costs, I think that's, that's, that's fair and clear. Um, I think it's important to note that the process itself accounts for that to a substantial degree. The executive order itself just speaks to benefits justifying costs, not outweighing costs, and absolutely uh, 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 permits the consideration of non-quantifiable, non-monetizable benefits. And so, again, from someone who's sort of worked it from the inside and seen it happening um, in real time, in real life, there are oftentimes serious considerations given to difficult to quantify benefits. And I'll give you very quickly three quick examples, and then I'll turn my microphone off. Uh, the first is the ADA rule that came out from Department of Justice in which the benefits in a billion dollar cost provision of allowing a disabled person to access the toilet by themselves as opposed to have someone help them carry the day. The benefits were almost negligible in terms of quantification. How do you quantify human dignity? But the benefits were deemed so important as to justify a billion dollar cost to industry across the country. Uh, second, the HIV uh, entry ban, uh, that rulemaking uh, from uh, CDC and, 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 and HHS was in part uh, justified on the non-quantified benefit of, first of all, not being associated with North Korea and Iran and other countries who still uh, carry out this ban, um, but also on human dignity and sort of foreign uh, uh, national security um, uh, uh, grounds. Um, and the third is the prison rape rule, again, out of the Department of Justice incongruously. But, um, I, I don't think that even the economists uh, at the agency in OIRA have gone to the extent of trying to do willingness to pay analyses on, on rape. Um, the bottom line is, when you go to jail, the bargain isn't that you're subjected to sexual assault. 
And the benefit of preventing that, while non-quantifiable, again, was a huge factor in justifying a very costly rule. Hi, I'm Susie Kim from the Washington Post. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, first, I was wondering what you believe the biggest changes uh, to rulemaking under OIRA during the Obama administration and, and Cass Sunstein's leadership have been, and whether these have been positive or negative. And the second, I was wondering if anyone wanted to weigh in on the RAINS Act um, in terms of bringing, uh, you know, what, what Congress is, is demanding in terms of uh, more accountability so that Congress would basically have to give an up or down vote to final rules before they were uh, implemented. Thanks. I think you just made our panel stay. Um, well, we can just start and go straight down. Is that good? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe. It's, it's so much less fun if you start with me. <laughs> okay, well, we can start. Uh, <laughs> Michael, it's, start with you, Michael, it's your big <laughs> chance. Okay, sorry, that, that's right. I'm not, I won't, oh, okay. I won't shirk my role. In the, You're not going to give up your. Uh, just to, here I am. I got um, this. <clears throat> Because I really want to hear what they have to say to your first question. But on the uh, on the first question, I don't think there were huge, there, are, there have been huge differences. On the on the second question, uh, I, I think the Reins Act is designed to to forestall significant rulemaking. Full stop. And you know, the idea that that both houses of Congress have to act within a limited time frame without amendment to a prove a major rule is not a system designed to get to win <laughs> enactment of any major rule. I, mean, I, I can think of examples where Congress has had trouble acting quickly, <laughs> <laughs> with no offense to anyone in the room. Uh, I guess it won't surprise uh, on the first question uh, for me to say, that I think uh, OIRA has done um, a very good job, certainly not a perfect job, um, in, in carrying out its duties under the Obama administration. I think I would just highlight a couple things, because I do, as I said earlier, think that there's oftentimes less difference than more uh, when you're talking about the OIRA review process, because it's just it's, it's part of a screening process that has analytical foundations which remain con consistent administration to administration. Um, but I, I, I do think the Obama administration has done uh, a good job, uh, and uh, certainly in the first three years when I was there, in, in looking hard at um, a balanced approach to regulation. Again, um, Rob would probably disagree with this. That he, he would have wanted probably a more aggressive regulatory posture from the administration, I'm guessing. Um, but I can assure you there are plenty of people who felt um, that the posture was too aggressive. And again, I, I think that's not a bad place to be. I think this administration has done an immense amount with respect to issuing rules with high net benefits uh, that are demonstrable uh, in protecting people and protecting the environment, but done so in a very balanced way with very careful consideration to the burdens and the unintended consequences. I think one other important thing occurred during this administration. While there have been attempts at uh, retrospective review of regulations uh, over the years, including some in the Clinton administration, some in the, in, 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 in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, I think this administration arguably has done more in that area to deal with the ex-ante question of regulation. Uh, we have the best ex, um, uh, I'm sorry, ex-post uh, question. We, we, we have the best ex-ante ex or before the fact review system in the world. I did a lot of international regulatory work there, and the world still views the OIRA process as sort of the gold standard in terms of regulatory review. But like most countries in the world, we all don't do a very good job of looking back to see actually what happened. Did the, did the benefits actually exceed those that were estimated? Did the costs exceed them? Did the rule work right? And I think this administration has done a lot to codify through executive order, so by family rules, if you will, a process by which agencies will go back and look at significant regulations and see whether they got them right and what they can do differently. Time will tell whether that process will bear as much fruit as is hoped, but I think it's a very substantial effort. Before we go to Susan, I just want to push you a little bit on this, which is, you know, a asking you, you know, 
how, you know, how good a job you thought you did is like asking people whether they like puppies. I agree. Is the, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's um, why I acknowledged at the beginning my obvious bias. So my question for you <laughs> would, would sort of be the opposite, which is are there things, in your opinion, that could have been done better? I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that any comes to mind at the moment in terms of overarching procedure, but I don't want to be one of those people that says, we made no mistakes and we can't do it better because I don't believe that. Um, I think there are some areas in terms of procedural transparency and follow through with the agencies that clearly can get more attention. I think there may have been some individual calls, which I'm not going to discuss uh, specifically here, where we may not have, have gotten it right. Um, but that, I think, is to be expected. No process is perfect. Um, I'm going to push back and just say um, that um, while it wasn't perfect, I am a firm believer that at the end of the day, if you aggregate the benefits and costs of the entire process, at the end of the day, the corpus or totality of regulation uh, in this administration is much better because of the process, even if there were some uh, possible missteps in there. <clears throat> so we're applying cost-benefit analysis to cost-benefit analysis. It's Susan. Um, with respect to your first question about OIRA, I'd say three things. One is that um, President Obama reinforced OIRA's role and the role of regulatory analysis. He appointed Cass Sunstein to head the office, and I think that was um, you know, a very strong choice of someone to head the office. And I'll agree with Michael on the retrospective review. They've institutionalized it in a way that I think going forward has the potential to, to really, not just, as Michael said, look forward at the rules we're about to issue, but to see whether the ones we've put in place actually have are having their intended effect. Um, on the RAINS Act question, um, I actually have an article on this, which I'll happily send you. But I think there are advantages and disadvantages um, on net. I think the advantages are that it would make Congress more accountable. Uh, and um, so I would, I would change the name to the Congressional Accountability Act and, um, for, for regulations. Um, I would third or second or whatever I am now at this uh, sequence, uh, the Michael's observation that the retrospective reviews under Executive Order 13563 have probably been more pronounced and sustained in this administration than uh, in previous ones. I looked at the ones during the Clinton administrations and the Bush administrations, and I think this one is at least the, the level of effort in going into it is, is uh, far and ahead, head, head and shoulders above the other administrations, that I, at least as far as I could tell. Um, in terms of the RAINS Act, um, there is a CRS report on, on the RAINS Act, uh, and one of the findings uh, with regard to in that report is that uh, the RAINS Act would require congressional approval of all major rules, and major being defined as rules that have a $100 million impact on the economy. Um, and impact on the economy has been defined to include transparency uh, or tra uh, transfer payments, essentially Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements, uh, when the NRC uh, annually sets its fee reimbursement uh, rates and stuff and retrieves eight or nine hundred million dollars from the nuclear power industry, that becomes a major rule simply because it's a transfer of money. Uh, so about 40 percent of all major rules are these transfer payments and fee structure rules and bird hunting rules and so forth. And so, so those would be swept up into the RAINS congressional approval process as well. Um, glad the discussion about independent uh, agencies has come up, um, and especially related to uh, the bill that was just proposed, the Warner-Portman bill. I wanted to ask uh, your opinion on um, kind of an interesting feature of that bill. Um, the way that it allows for OIRA review of independent, independent agency analyses is to um, allow for uh, basically their criticism or their analysis, their review of the independent agency rule to be placed um, on the record publicly, the kind of IRA, RIA um, of an independent agency rulemaking to be placed on the record uh, publicly if they happen to challenge the independent agency RIA. But it stops short of allowing, the, of allowing OIRA to reject a rule explicitly. So I think it's a way to preserve, in some degree, independent agencies' you know, independence. But it strikes me as uh, interesting in the context of transparency because here you've created a situation where um, OIRA is more transparent uh, with respect to their RIAs uh, concerning independent agencies than they are with respect to executive agencies. So I'm curious as to whether this um, is, you know, this kind of ironic feature uh, of the bill um, could call for um, increased transparency with respect to executive agency RIAs. Um, you know, there's, uh, as Susan Dudley says, 
um, OIRA is excellent at doing these RIAs, so it would be nice to see. Well, actually, OIRA doesn't do RIAs. It just reviews RIAs. Um, but interestingly, the, um, in President Carter's administration, there was an office within the Council on Wage and Price Stability that did just that. It, it reviewed regulations and put and filed these detailed comments on the public record. Um, you weren't part of it. Um, I'll mention Jim again, but he actually wasn't. There are those who participated in that and then also um, were on the career staff of OIRA who thought that that was a better, um, a, a better way of, of working. I think there are trade-offs. You wouldn't get what I like and Rob doesn't, which is, the well, maybe you would. You know, public sunshine may be a way to put pressure on agencies to do a better job of the analysis. Okay, we do have time for another question. Well, Michael, did you, did you have, I'm sorry, well, did you I, have, I was essentially quickly going to say, first of all, it is ironic, um, <laughs> but it may be um, irony necessitated by some form of accountability um, in the process, uh, and that's the lever that, that's available um, to maintain a degree of independence. Um, I do think the question is a good one, though. Can the OIRA process accommodate even more um, openness in terms of the constructive comments or even criticism that goes back and forth, not just between them, but everybody who participates in the process, because it's very much more than just OIRA. And I think that's a, a great question. I think there are absolutely trade-offs in that. I think it could undermine the process if it's too much. Um, remember, the Constitutional Convention was kept closed by Madison for the reason that he wanted candid and open discussion of controversial issues. Having said that, OIRA does operate, say, in the clean air context, where there, um, vir virtually every communication that occurs as part of the review and the rulemaking is made public. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well in the EPA air context. So I think it's a fascinating question that deserves more discussion. And every time someone mentions that the Constitutional Convention was closed, I am forced to mention that not only was the Declaration of Independence signed, but it was signed in such a way, at least apocryphally, that uh, King George III could see all the people who put their <laughs> names John on Hancock's. it. At least John Hancock's. At least John Hancock's. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, one of the points of a deliberative democracy is, of course, is you know, one the deliberations need to be able to take place, but also that it is indeed a democracy, and that although things may be better run behind closed doors, better run for whom is always the question. Uh, and with that, yes. is there time for one more question? So the food safety community has been really, really concerned because they've been waiting for a bunch of... Can you of speak up just a little bit, please? Or just hold it closer. Oh, so the food safety community has been up in arms for the last couple of months because they've been waiting for a couple of food safety rules, including the produce produce safety rule, since January 2012. And they've taken out huge ads in the Washington Post, you know, they've obviously been blogging, I've been blogging. So my question is, is as OIRA goes forward, what are you going to do to make sure that communities that are really concerned about public safety are told what's happening to those rules? Because what I'm hearing is that nobody knows. So that's, that's so it's a good question about are things basically going into the black hole and is there anything that can be done about it? And maybe there's nothing that we can say besides that's a really. But good I point. do wonder: Have you gone in? You wouldn't be told where it is, what's happening. But have you gone in? Have you requested a meeting with OIRA? I think um, people that are more senior in food safety. Um, food can you give her the mic so that we can get it? But that's right. It's yeah. She said yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> she said she hasn't, but she thinks but pe so. People have. Okay. Uh, I think. Well, well, I have one thing to add. So, I mean, sure. Just by way of context, the mystery for this is okay. that there's pretty good agreement between um, consumer groups and industry on this set of things, and so there, that's why it's an it's an unusual mystery as compared to other mm -hmm. mysteries like the silica rule. I can make up a story about why it's stuck, but this one really is a mystery, and I think people are, are highly frustrated and. It, it's hard to sort of say what the transparency is besides actually just someone explaining it. Um, you know, there's, there's some concern that, that rules are basically just not issuing between now and the election. On the other hand, even that doesn't seem like an adequate explanation where industry is on board. So it is, uh, maybe it's a good case for you, for, for you, Daniel, on this, this. Me, you're giving me work? I'm giving, well, you know, I left in December of 11, so I don't know. <laughs> like, here we are, this is, what better, you know, there's, you can't even guess, actually. There's not even a good guess about what's going on. So it's a good case for 
That's not my foundation. So what I'd like to do is move to just a closing comment from each person on the panel, and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, you want to start, Chris? Sure. I mean, I, I, I should have said at the outset that um, I am technically uh, still uh, a gratuitous service employee with the uh, Congressional Research Service. So, uh, you know, any comments are not to be attributed to them. Uh, hopefully I didn't say anything too controversial. Most of what I was saying was, was basically a recitation of what was in this GAO report. And Michael's right there. Uh, you know, it really hasn't been examined uh, at least since 2009. So, uh, but I, you know, I think that there still are opportunities for improved transparency within OIRA. Uh, and that's, uh, th that has been sort of a long-standing issue, uh, really going back to the early 80s. Um, it, other issues that are now in front of Congress are, you know, whether Cong the size of OIRA should be improved, whether they should review more agencies and so forth, those are all a uh, whole kettle of fish, you know. So uh, just, um, but I think there's plenty to contemplate here, and it's, uh, it's a, to me it's a fascinating issue, a group of about 50 people that sit really at the apex of a lot of federal activity where the rubber really hits the road. And, uh, and so the more attention to this, the better, I think. Um, I, I have no inside information on the food safety rule, but I'll just venture a guess that food safety crosses a lot of different agencies. So EPA would be interested, the Department of Agriculture would be interested, obviously FDA, um, and that may be where the holdup is, is that there really just are some real conflicts in how best to address it, but I have no idea. Um, but if you're interested in OIRA, um, I have um, a volume here. We hosted a conference last year on OIRA's 30th anniversary. You have a copy, too. It's an excellent volume with actually, um, is it not an excellent volume? It's, it's, <laughs> with, with articles by several people in this room, um, including yours truly. But it, um, all the former administrators um, spoke and former career deputies spoke and so and many of them actually wrote articles and my colleague and I brought a few copies if anybody wants them if not you can send us an email and we can get you to get them to you okay. I think the uh, in closing I would just say I think the OIRA process uh, is here to stay I think it's been developed and evolved over um, seven or eight administrations and certainly in its current form since uh, 1981 and so I think um, it, is, uh, it, it is now a mature bipartisan uh, process uh, in terms of its support. I think it adds a, a, immense value to the regulatory process. Having said that, it absolutely is a process that needs to continue to evolve and that can certainly be improved. And I think I just um, uh, congratulate uh, Daniel, you and, and your committee on having this panel and discussing these complex issues because I think unless people talk about these in these kind of fora, there's le it's less likely that such change will occur. And I think in the, in the transparency area, uh, there are no doubt some uh, improvements to the process that could be made, which would make it uh, even better going forward. What better way to spend an August afternoon than talking about <laughs> OIRA for an hour and a half? Thank you all for, for sitting around. Um, I'll follow Susan's example and do a little mini advertisement. Um, I don't, I don't even look at the bio. So Public Citizen is co-chair, are we in here? No, it's not even on here. So we are co-chair of a coalition for sensible safeguards, which works on a wide variety of, of regulatory issues. Jenny Rabnett, who's the coordinator, was here, but I think walked out. So I'll point to the guy who planted that last question, um, who's my colleague, Amit Narang. Um, Amit, want to raise your hand? So, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Wasn't that great a question, it's all right. So <laughs> if, uh, if anyone wants any more information, please get in touch with Amit. Excellent. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been really just well done, and I, I appreciate all the comments that you've made, also to the, the audience for being here. Since I know that you are all regulatory fiends and you can't get enough of this, uh, link to the Admin Law Review, uh, to Curtis's GAO report, to the CRS reports, um, and to many other things, including, I think, from Public Citizen, although I have to double check, are all available at transparencycaucus.org. Uh, there's a lot of additional issues that will need to be discussed, and I'm sure will continue to come up, whether it's independent agencies, the role of Congress, the level of transparency, implementing the EO, and many other things. And of course, we have to look forward to a new administrator for OIRA being appointed, uh, which will also be a lot of fun. So thank you to our panelists, and thank you all very much. <laughs>